Thanksgiving is four days away. Is that correct? Four days away, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Let me be the, uh, hopefully the first to tell you, happy Thanksgiving. My gripe, I'm probably not alone, is skipping Thanksgiving and going straight to Christmas. And um, I feel like Thanksgiving is such a great holiday, a day that's set aside for us to show and to be thankful that we can't miss it, we can't skip it. I personally am thankful for you. And I'm thankful for the family that we have here at Capital City Church. If it's your first day and you decide to stick around, you're part of the family. Automatically, it's just like that. If you come three times, you're part of the family, whether you want to be or not. It's just one of those things where you're just in. But um, I'm thankful for you. And I love the fact that we've done life together this last year, for the growth that you've had over this last year, beginning in January, as we've made resolutions to be transformed, how God's working in your lives. I'm grateful that I am part of this church family. And, um, and I'm excited to see what God's going to do in you over this next year. And so I hope that you're going to celebrate Thanksgiving, and I hope that you're not skipping Thanksgiving. Well, what do you mean by skipping Thanksgiving, Pastor Rick? I mean, does your home look like Christmas or does it look like Thanksgiving? I want to see a show of hands. How many of your homes look like Christmas already? Truth? Okay. All right. Um, so... My wife gets to make the call with stuff like this. I mean, I, I certainly, I mean, she does what she wants to do anyway. It's not like I tell her what she can and can't do, but I do ask from time to time. And uh, I don't like skipping Thanksgiving. And so I've asked Joy before, I'm like, hey, don't decorate for Christmas until after Thanksgiving, please. You know, I just I like to just let it breathe. And, um, and so she looks at me and I'm sure in her mind says, well, I'll take that into consideration. <laughs> you know, she doesn't say it out loud. And so I noticed the boxes coming up, you know, and normally I bring the boxes up from our little storage in the basement. I noticed the boxes were coming up on their own when I would leave and go, you know, out and appointments and work and things. I'd come back and there were boxes and I'm like, man, somebody's breaking in and bringing the Christmas boxes up. And then Joy began to, to decorate, or somebody did, who was you know, in our house when we weren't home. And uh, I said, Joy, these, these are Christmas decorations. And she said, oh, no, they're not. They're winter decorations. <laughs> she said they were winter decorations. And so uh, I couldn't really say anything about that. And then Pastor Dan came over last Wednesday, once a month. We have a three-hour meeting on Wednesdays to plan and pray for you guys and talk about things that are coming up. And I looked over at the mantle, and there were five stockings that were hung by the chimney with care. That is not a winter decoration. That's Christmas. So when Joy got home, I said, sweetheart, what's the deal with the Christmas decorations? And she said, well, I'm not going to turn the lights on until after Thanksgiving. So that was her, that was her concession to me. So we are not decorated for Christmas until the lights come on. But when they come on, it's full on Christmas time. So we're enjoying winter decorations, complete with stockings and trees that look a lot like Christmas, but not quite yet. Thanksgiving is a day we don't want to skip. I talked to you last week about being thankful. We were talking about a psalm that uh, I want to remind you of as we get into what we're going to discuss today. The psalm was and is, uh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. And I talked to you last week, just as a reminder about the word is and how important the word is, is. That the is, I S stood for, I am here in this moment right now. I am present right now. I reminded you that a recent Harvard study said that 47% of people in a crowd, their minds and their, their bodies are in different places within just an almost immediate period of time. It's scary how fast it happens. And I asked you last week if you were still with me. That was like 10 minutes into my, to my message time. And some of you just kind of smiled and said, what'd you say? <laughs> I wasn't paying any attention. It's human nature. You fight your human nature. We fight our sin nature. We fight our calendars. We fight our stress. I mean, pulling us out of the moment. I am here, so is the Lord, I-S. Can't be there yesterday, can't be there tomorrow. When I get to tomorrow, I can be there in the now. But now I can only be here in the now, and that's where Jesus meets me. Two troubling phrases that I mentioned to you last week, you might be struggling with right now that could pull you away from what God wants to do in you. One, when that, two, what if? When that happens, then I'll be happy. When Thanksgiving gets here, when the kids come, when the kids leave, when school is over, when the exams are concluded, when I get married, when the first of the year gets here, when I get the promotion, when I get the raise, if we're always living for the when, we're never in the now. What if? Well, this is what paralyzes us because we are never fully present in the moment. 
worried about the consequences of the future. What's going to happen? What if I'm not doing now what I need to, to do to make tomorrow okay? And we can be paralyzed by fear and frustration and thoughts of failure. It pulls us out of being present in the now. So is there something around the corner in your life that is pulling you away from being fully present today? Now, I don't want you to necessarily say that it's pulled you, but let me just ask you if there's something that's fighting for your mind, for your thoughts, for your attention. Is there potentially something in your life that could be, if you weren't vigilant, pulling you away from the now and having you preoccupied or focused on something in the future or perhaps even the past? Does anybody resonate with that? Is there no one in here that resonates with that? Am I the only one? I, want, I need some honesty in here. I'm going to look to my honest side of the room over here. How many people have something that could potentially, anybody else want to join in? Everybody has something that could potentially be pulling you away from the now and, and, or tra trapping you in the past. And we want to get rid of that. We want to, to give that to the Lord because now is the moment God speaks to us. Now is the moment that we can be and show love and be loved. Now is the moment that you can be with the people who are around you. It's the moment you worship. It's the moment you grow. And so I wanna pray for you. We're gonna dive into a story that some of you know really well. Some of you may not know at all, but I'm gonna do my best to tell it to you. And I think it's gonna encourage you. And then we're gonna come back together and I'm gonna challenge you in a way that might surprise you. But if you take the challenge, your relationships in your life can be better, different, more at peace than you ever imagined. Father, thank you for my friends and I pray that you would be with them, that you would ground us right now in the now, in this moment. Allow us to be centered around your truth, to experience your love and just to have a peace that's supernatural that allows us to focus. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. We're going to be talking about Zacchaeus from the book of Luke. And um, Zacchaeus was asking a couple of questions. The questions were really important questions. And the question was this. He said, does God care about me? Now, it wasn't a question he asked out loud. It was a question that was implied by his behavior. Um, but many of us ask this question. As a matter of fact, a lot of us have asked this question. Some of us ask this question more than once. And we wonder if God really cares about us. Oftentimes, when we go through difficult times, we wonder if God really cares about us. We, we think that nobody else is paying attention, that no one cares, that time is running out, that God may be distant. And we want to know, does he care? Am I important? Do I matter? Is my life significant? Is this all just a game? And, and when we ask this question, if we're faithful to ask this question, we get the answer to the question. And the answer to the question is one that brings so much peace and so much hope, but yet many of us don't have the courage to ever really ask it with a sincere heart. The question can trap you in the past. If you're filled with regret over things that you've done, maybe honest saying, if I were God, I wouldn't want to have a relationship with somebody like me. That if I knew the things about you that you know about you, and maybe nobody else knows about you, I don't know that I'd, you know, you know what I'm talking about? You get trapped. You get lost back there somewhere. You define yourself, you identify yourself with your darkest moment. And sometimes the question, does God even care, can trap you back there somewhere and you never let yourself out. Well, it can scare us about the future because a life without purpose or a life without a point is not a life worth living. When I make my own decisions and call my own shots, I find that I usually take a long walk into the middle of nowhere and I leave myself for dead. And then I look around and go, God, help me. Um, because of... Uh, I know where my plans take me, but I have also learned where God's plan takes me. But sometimes if we really don't know that God cares, we begin to take the reins or control of our life and man, it becomes a very scary future. Sometimes it motivates us to take a risk, a risk to step out on a limb and to find out once and for all, am I Jesus kind of person? Does he really care about me? Grace in concept certainly exists. I mean, grace is receiving from something, something from God that, you know, that, we, that we don't deserve. Grace and mercy work hand in hand and, and it exists, but it really doesn't exist in our own lives until we experience it. 
in a relationship until you experience it. Grace does not really exist until it's experienced because it takes a relationship to understand it. And in the story we're going to talk about, Jesus is introducing himself, extending his hand and developing a relationship with somebody that's really unlikely, a person who's really unlovable, a person who should be or could be trapped in the past, definitely should be concerned about the future, and you wouldn't really think would be ready to humble themselves and to step out on a limb and to find out who God is. For some people, stepping out on a limb, climbing a tree um, is just like coming to church for the first time or maybe even listening to a sermon online or asking a question. It takes courage, and um, that's the kind of courage that God honors. So I'm going to break this down for you, the setting of the story. We'll get into it. We'll come back, and we'll apply this again in a way that I think will surprise you, but challenge you. Jericho is where the story takes place. Two different cities. One was the ruins of Jericho because Joshua fought the battle of Jericho back when the Israelites took over the Can uh, land of Canaan. It was one of the first battle they fought and Jericho was destroyed by God, considered cursed by uh, Joshua. And so the new Jericho was built outside the old walls of Jericho. There were two cities of Jericho, the ruins that you walk through and then the new city that was kind of like the Las Vegas of the Middle East. It wasn't considered to be a city that you would go uh, for a spiritual retreat. But if you wanted entertainment, that was a place that you might want to go and spend a few days. Um, nothing good could happen in Jericho and no one good could come from Jericho, according to most Jews at the time, because of its history. The second person or thing that I want you to pay attention to is Jesus. Now we developed this last week. He was passing through. He was busy. I mean, he was on his way. If you look at his schedule, it said in his schedule, go into Jerusalem, have my last supper with my disciples, leave the gospel and my mission with them, be arrested, be tried, be tortured, be crucified, rise again, ascend into heaven. I mean, stuff that would keep a person pretty busy, you would understand why they would have a lot going on. Jesus was busy, but yet fully present in the moment. So present that he noticed, so present that he engaged, so present that he never seemed like he was in a hurry. And then you have Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus is the uh, focus of the story, but I'm gonna focus it in a minute in a little different way. Zacchaeus, his name meant righteous one. Now, for those who've grown up in church, and that would be some of us here, this is one of the first stories that you hear when you start going to church. If you go to Sunday school or, or back when I was a kid, training union, I mean, I learned this story uh, with flannel graph characters in a little tiny classroom, some nice old lady probably feeding me some kind of stale goldfish crackers or animal crackers, and I'm drinking bad church juice. I mean, I remember the stories from when I was this tall, but you may not have had that experience. And if you haven't had that experience, it doesn't mean there's something wrong with you. It just means you don't know. So for many, when I say Zacchaeus, they're like, oh, he was the wee little man. And they sing the song that we sang that was very politically incorrect, but it was a song they taught us back in the day when we were, when we were kids. But if you don't know, um, I can't really be super comprehensive. And we've talked about it twice as a church body over the last eight years that I've been your pastor. But Zacchaeus was, um, even though his name meant righteous one, he had a physical challenge, and that was that he was short. So short that many historians believe that he was a little person. And back in Jesus' day, they did not treat people who were physically different the way we do, with dignity and respect and love. They believed that somebody like Zacchaeus would have been cursed, some by the devil, some by God. And he would have been ridiculed from the time he was a baby until the time that he enters the scene in this story. Now, somebody who's under six foot tall, I've always considered myself not tall, but super short and not super short. Zacchaeus would have been somebody that was super short. The average Jewish man would have been five, one to five, three back in the day. Zacchaeus probably four foot or less, little. And because of that, he had two choices. He was bullied. He had the deck stacked against him from birth. And instead of choosing a life of love and peace, he chose to be really good at being really bad. And he was really, really good at it. He was obviously smart. He was obviously ruthless. And you know, he'd been picked on so many times. 
that he was ready to get even against the very people that should have been his kinsmen, his Jewish people, his fellow worshipers of the one true God, but not Zacchaeus. He became a tax collector, which was as far from being a Jew, a good Jew that you could go. He bought a tax franchise and extorted, stole. He was a thug from the very people who he should have been taking care of and protecting. And that's just the way it was. But Zacchaeus was a spiritual seeker. And you ask me, well, how do you know? Well, it wasn't as much in what he said as what he did. Now, Zacchaeus was a courageous man. He was a risk-taking man. He was a man that took all of his chips and shoved them across the line and said, I'm all in. Either I'm accepted or it's the end of me. I'm humiliated. I'm a joke. There's no turning back. Let me read the story to you. You may know it, but just indulge me as we read this again. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through, busy, passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and he was very wealthy, stolen everything that he had. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead. You go, what's the big deal? Jewish men didn't run. I don't like to run. When I run, I look like I've been in an accident or that somebody's chasing me. I don't run because I don't enjoy running. I like to walk. Jewish men did not run because it was undignified. They would pay somebody to run for them, but they were never wanting to be seen as in a hurry. So he ran. Now that was one thing that was unusual. And then the second thing he did was he climbed. And not only was that unusual, but likely unsightly because um, men wore man dresses back in the day. And you don't want anybody climbing up above your head in a crowd when they're wearing a skirt. That's just not appropriate behavior. So you've got a man who's a professional thug, organized crime, good at good, good, good at being bad, who runs up ahead of Jesus. All the people who he's stolen from, who hate his guts, who knows, maybe even shoving him back, maybe even you know talking about him, whispering about him, goes to a tree climbs up the tree. Who knows how much trouble he had getting up the tree. And he did it because he wanted to see Jesus. Jesus was coming that way. Now, the tension would have been rising because Jesus, I mean, at least people then thought that he likely represented God. Only a few really believed he was in fact God, the son of God, Jesus. But still, the connection was unmistakable. Zacchaeus cursed by God, according to his Jewish tradition. Perhaps even cursed by the devil, somebody who should have been an outcast. Good church people would never talk to him. They talk about him. Oh, let's pray for Zacchaeus and then list all of his sins. Disgusting. But here comes Jesus. What's he going to do? The crowd watching the disciples watching. Jesus walks right up to Zacchaeus, looks him in the eyes. He was seen, which is a gift that so many people feel like they never get. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. Not bossy endearing, friendly. I must spend some time with you. I want to get to know you, Zacchaeus. You're not a problem or a prop or an example in some sermon. You're a person. And I want to get to know you. I want to spend time with you. Can you imagine Zacchaeus? Too good to be true. Come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So Zacchaeus came down the tree at once and he welcomed Jesus gladly. Well, there are a few things I want to point out to you. We're almost done with this section. Number one, Zacchaeus was desperate and he took a risk. He risked his dignity. He risked his reputation. He risked his emotional security 
because what he had was not what you would want anybody you love to have, but it was something. And surely something's better than nothing. He was desperate. The crowd was despicable, highly religious, highly judgmental, highly pharisaical. Oh, Zacchaeus isn't our kind of person. Jesus, if he's truly God, would never talk to somebody like that. Jesus was determined to prove the crowd wrong and to show Zacchaeus that he had value. So where do you see yourself in this story? Maybe you've just decided to be good at being bad. Maybe you've decided that you wanted to go as far as you possibly can from what you think that God wants from you or for you. And um, maybe you have really good reasons for it. Maybe something happened to you you didn't ask for, maybe you blame God. Maybe you did something earlier in your life that labeled you and your family turned their back on you. Maybe church treated you in a way that would be a lot like the crowd, despicably judging you instead of understanding alienating you instead of extending a hand. Maybe you're just the kind of person that feels marginalized. There's just something that about you and you're not sure what it is. You just have these behaviors or characteristics that just seem to push people away and you don't really know why, but you find yourself alone and you just assume that alone is where you belong and that alone means that God himself doesn't wanna have a lot to do with you. Feel forgotten and unimportant. Maybe you just feel like you fade into the background. And Zacchaeus took a risk and Jesus sealed the deal, signifying, symbolizing, you're important, I love you, I forgive you, and I have a plan for you. And Jesus either has or will do the same thing for you. And I'll tell you what, I'm thankful for that. I mean, that makes me thankful. And there's more that I want to tell you about out of this story that will make you thankful as well. But before we get there, we're going to sing. You know, there are a lot of us uh, in here, many of us who can sing that all my life he's been faithful, or at least our lives in Christ, he's been faithful and that he's been good because we've come to a point, many of us, where we've decided to um, turn from our own ways and trust him as our Lord and Savior and start a new life. And if you've listened to the first part of the message and you've heard me talk about Zacchaeus as he started a new life in Christ, and you wonder how in the world is that even possible? Um, it's such a simple, profound, and powerful thing that I just wanna tell you about it as we continue. You come to the point in life where you decide you wanna live a different plan. You recognize the fact that you know God really does love me even though I've done a lot in my life to avoid his love or haven't simply experienced it. You agree with him that there are things in your life that have been displeasing to him, thoughts, actions, attitudes, the Bible calls them sin. Confess it, I'm sorry, God, I, I don't wanna do this anymore, forgive me. We believe who Jesus is, God's son, 100% God and 100% man. It's a miracle that two could exist in the same person. Perfect, never ever making a mistake, living 33 years. The last three years involved in a ministry that we call it, where he kind of went public with the kingdom of God and what he was about, his message. Begin to do things like this interaction with Zacchaeus, share stories that we talk about all the time in church that, that we say, man, this relationship with Jesus is what I want. I believe who the Bible says that he is, that he died on the cross for my sins, the debt that I couldn't pay. He rose again and defeated sin, Satan, and death's claim over me. That's very complicated and flowery the way I word it, but you just say it in the way that you mean it, that you wanna follow him with your life. You don't wanna follow yourself anymore and you pray it to him. Now, some of us make prayer really weird. Seems like it's really hard. We gotta know Shakespearean English and we have to be these and thous and thuses and therefores and try to impress God by unlocking the magic key. Nothing could be further from the truth. Just listen to me real quickly. If you're confused at all about this, I wanna to help with this because it's so important. A prayer is just you thinking a thought that's directed toward God, that's it. 
And God has installed in you since before you were born the ability to think thoughts that he can hear, that he understands, that he knows. And he'll communicate back to you in that same place. And all you have to do is tell him that's what you want and you begin a new life. And the song that we just sang can be your song as well. Now, the book of Luke is a fantastic, fantastic book. A good friend just pointed out to me and I should have recognized this before. I knew it, but I didn't know it quite this way that Luke has 24 chapters. You know, I know I've been to seminary. They teach you things like that in seminary, but the significance escaped me. That's how slow I am. Do you know there are 24 days in December before Christmas? Did you know that? Uh, it starts with December 1st and goes all the way to December 24th. And December 24th happens to be the last day of the last chapter if you're reading a chapter a day of the book of Luke. So if you want to dig into the book of Luke, um, phenomenal gospel, an account of Jesus' life, and you want to do it in December, I challenge you to start on December 1st. Do it with your family if you want to, if, by yourself if you want to. Read this uh, on December 1st, Luke 1. December 2nd, Luke two. Yeah. December 5th, uh, Luke five. Yeah. And, and work your way through to the 24th where you will read Luke 24. Yeah. And uh, Luke has some fantastic passages in Luke chapter seven. There's two little stories that, that we learn about Jesus. One was a Roman centurion, a soldier who uh, was really good at soldiering, but didn't have a relationship with Jesus yet. He had not been told about Jesus. He hadn't really learned the truth and he had been hearing the rumors and wasn't sure. And so he sent, he had a, a person in his household that was sick and he sent for Jesus and, and Jesus started to come and the centurion, the soldier met Jesus out in the marketplace and said, listen, you don't even want to come to my house. I'm not the kind of person who you want to visit. You shouldn't even waste your time on me. And not only did Jesus waste his time on him, which Jesus didn't think was a waste at all, healed the person, the member of the centurion's household, extended a new relationship with Christ, and this man began to live a different way. Later in Luke chapter seven, a woman took a risk, big time risk. She was a woman of ill repute, uh, a, a woman of the night prostitute. And she broke into a dinner party that Jesus was attending, ran past security, threw herself at Jesus' feet, crying, anointing his feet. Jesus offered her a different way to live. The world had told her, it's too late, you've done too much, you're not Jesus' kind of person. Jesus said, you're exactly my kind of person, extended a hand and gave her a new life. Luke is a phenomenal book. So we come to the chapter where we are in Zacchaeus' life and I want to uh, finish the story and apply this in a way, again, that you may find surprising. All the people saw Jesus embracing Zacchaeus and they began to mutter, in the Hebrew, the word for mutter or grumble is gongusmos, and it's automatopoeic. It sounds like it is. Um, it's it's um, uh, gongusmo, gongusmo, gongusmo. You know, just like this mutter, this undercurrent, talking about them. Can you believe Jesus likes these kind of people? Riff raff. You know, they would judge him. We got to put Jesus on the prayer list because clearly Jesus, you know, spending too much time with people. I mean, it would be one of those kinds of things. This churchy crowd, you're like, man, don't you get it? Jesus just said, this is the point not the problem. They begin to mutter and said, he's gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look, Lord, here and now I give half my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay it back four times. Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is one of us. Now, the way that Jesus worded it was contextually Back in this first century, he said that he's a son of Abraham. But for us, it would mean he's one of us. For the son of man, for Jesus, speaking about himself, came to seek and save those who know they are lost. Not for those who think it's their job to point out who needs Jesus, but don't really understand their need themselves. Zacchaeus' life was changed and changed forever. Let's look at a couple things that I think are significant. One, thankful people respond to, to Jesus. Zacchaeus made things right in his relationships. And the way he did that was through finances because Zacchaeus was a thief. He was a thug, he was an extortionist. He was um, a blackmailer. Most of his crimes against people had to do with finance and he made things right. And he didn't do it to get God's approval. 
He did it because he found God's approval. Does that make, does that make sense? I want to say it again because I don't want you to miss it. He didn't do it to buy God's approval. Look at my good deeds, God, so that you will forgive me. He did it because Jesus gave him approval. He saw him as a person, extended friendship and relationship and said, I see in you what you don't see in yourself. Will you live a different way? And Zacchaeus says, man, boy, will I watch? And he did it. Jesus called him one of us. Not because of his behavior, but because of his belief. Now, isn't that a thinker? Before Zacchaeus found a personal relationship with Jesus, what had he changed in his life? Had he cleaned up? No. He changed nothing except the disposition of his heart. And when his heart changed, his behavior immediately changed too because thankful people change the way that they live. Let's continue. Can't wait to get to the end of this with you. How are your relationships different since you've met Jesus? How are your finances different since you've met Jesus? How is your mission in your life, the purpose of your life, the point of your life different since you've met Jesus? Now, just bear with me these next few minutes because I'm gonna suggest something to some of you and you're not gonna wanna do it, but... I just want you to hear me out. One of the things about Jesus that blows me away is not just the people that he chose to touch or to engage with, to talk to, but the ones he chose not to. I mean, earlier in this same chapter of Luke, Jesus was coming into Jericho. And when he came into Jericho, there was a man on the side of the road that was hollering out, Jesus, have mercy on me. And the disciples said, shush, <laughs> Jesus can't be bothered by you. He's going somewhere. Can't you see how important this man is? And so Jesus, he passed all kinds of people yelling, help me, help me, help me, help me. Passed all kinds of people and went up to the one who God had brought God the Father into his life that day. Jesus walking into Jericho, passing through. I mean, thousands of people wanting to meet him. Signs up, John 3.16 signs, right? I mean, God is whatever. I mean, they didn't have John 3.16 signs, but you know what I mean, right? That came, that came later. I mean, this was a Christian crowd, right? A Jewish crowd. They didn't understand who Jesus was, but they wanted to see him. They were, I mean, he passed hundreds, thousands of people and went to the one, the one that God the Father gave him. I bet the disciples wondered. I certainly would have wondered. Why not them? What's so special about this one? What about the rest? And here's my hypothesis. Here's my, um, it's an educated guess. I believe that the reason that the people who Jesus omitted, the stories allow for that sort of a question is because Jesus expects us to connect with the ones that he can't. Now you're like, what do you mean he can't? Well, see, the thing about Jesus is he's not here right now. Now he's here, the Holy Spirit here indwells the life of a believer. But back then Jesus was physically present in a body and he was going, literally walking through a crowd, literally reaching out and touching people. And then when Jesus went into heaven, this is a lot. I know it's a whole different message for a different day. He said, listen, I'm going to go, but I'm leaving you something better than me because it's not limited by a body. It's not limited in proximity. The Holy Spirit is going to empower you to do the things that I would do if I were still here. And so Jesus multiplied himself by the thousands over time. And he said, you have to get them. And you can't reach them all, but you should at least be reaching one. Well, the need's overwhelming. Sure, you're not supposed to get everybody, but there should be somebody in your life. So who is it in your life? Jesus' message was a message of reconciliation and a message of peace. Peace with others, peace with God. Some of you have broken the peace. And some of you are going to experience it over the next few weeks when you're around people in your family or extended family. And those encounters will bring a little tension. 
And sometimes it's your fault. Now, sometimes it's maybe not your fault, but maybe you've contributed to it. Sometimes you think about the stuff that they've done and the reasons. And I mean, with family and close friends, I mean, there's history. My goodness. I mean, when you've been around somebody your whole life, I mean, you know the very worst, right? But I believe that our responsibility as Christians is to be reconcilers and peacemakers with the people closest to us first. There are one. And then as we reconcile and bring peace, then we move out to the next and the next and the next. And so many are like, well, I'm gonna go find me one that looks like a non-Christian, whatever that means to you, right? Somebody that I think's far from God and I'm gonna be nice to them. And I'll say, break your arm, patting yourself on the back. But how nice are you to your wife and your kids? How much of a peacemaker are you in your family? What kind of wake do you leave behind as you connect with sometimes the people who've known you the longest. Are you ready to begin that journey of reconciliation at home? Because that's what Jesus expects. Now, why would I be thinking about this right now? Because it's the holidays. You're gonna see a lot of people who you don't often have to see. And some of you love seeing your family and some of you don't. And some of you, you know, there's always that one. And you have to choose. Now, the Bible says in the book of Romans to do everything you can, everything that's possible to be at peace with people. There's sometimes it's not, not possible, not wise. Can't do it. Most of the time, however, you can. And so I want to challenge you to be on the mission of Jesus this Thanksgiving and Christmas and to start by being a bearer of peace and a reconciler of relationships. And some things that have been broken over a long time don't get fixed immediately. Sometimes it takes time. But what's more important? In January, the men, Cap City men, we're going to get together for four weeks and we're going to be talking about things like this. My closest relationship in my wife or in my life is my wife. The person I wake up next to in the morning. And so I ask myself the question, am I a bearer of peace in her life? Do I take responsibility for making sure that she's successful and thrives in her relationship with God, that I'm supportive in the things that, that she needs? Do I serve her like Jesus wants me to serve her? I mean, the stuff that I did to win her 35 years ago, you wouldn't believe. But there's things that I've stopped doing, things that I've taken for granted, things that I have to correct. Maybe with your kids. It's so hard to go back and repair and reconcile things you've broken, but so right. Brothers and sisters, parents, aunts and uncles, friends, regardless of who they voted for or how they yelled or what fights you've had or what they did when they were six, I want to challenge you. Do it if you want. See what happens. Number one, Forgive. Ah, oh, Rick, you're talking about forgiveness again. I think that forgiveness should be a theme around the holidays because we celebrate the forgiveness that Jesus offered us. So what makes me think I'm too good to forgive somebody else when Jesus wasn't too good to forgive me? How arrogant could I be? But I can be. What if somebody doesn't ask me for forgiveness? Doesn't matter. Forgiveness is a gift freely given because Jesus forgave us. Doesn't mean what they did was right. Doesn't even mean that there aren't consequences and it doesn't necessarily mean it's safe or wise to be around them. But it's part of being a bearer of peace and a reconciler of relationships. 
asking for forgiveness when you have been a part of breaking a relationship or fracturing the peace. That's a big one, but I believe it should be part of our Thanksgiving and Christmas. Words of encouragement and adding value. When you get together with those who are closest to you, are you just taking the opportunity to point out all the ways that they've failed or all the things they've done that have disappointed you or the things in their life that may not line up to scripture or whatever it is that you're just loaded and ready to say? Or could you arm yourself with words of encouragement and be a person this Thanksgiving and Christmas who adds value to every interaction that you have. The final one here is one for you, not one for the person that you're directing this toward, but it's part of fixing what's broken. I gotta fix what's broken this, uh, this Christmas season. I you know, don't like putting Christmas lights on my house. It's not that I object to Christmas lights like uh, religiously or morally or aesthetically. I just don't like putting them up. Don't like heights, don't like putting them up, don't like taking them down, never have. Some of you men are exceptional examples of love and service to your wives and uh, you love putting Christmas tree lights up. You're better than me, okay? I'll just admit it right now. I don't like it, never have liked it. The problem is I've passed it on to my boys. And... Um, the ladies in my boy's life like lights as much as my wife does. And so I asked Richard this year, because Emery wants Christmas lights. Are you going to put them on your house? He's like, I don't know. Eden wants them. Emery wants them. Huh, you know, bah humbug, a Grinch. And I first wanted to judge him going, son, that's not very nice. And I'm like, uh-oh, that's me right there. That's a mirror. And, and I asked my other son, Nathan. I'm like, Nate, you're going to put lights up on your house? He goes, ah, Leah wants them, but I don't. And I'm like, my goodness, what have I done? I'm a terrible, terrible dad. And, and, and the ladies in my son's life are paying the consequences for my bad behavior. So this is what I decided to do. Now, don't pat me on the back for this. I'm not patting myself on the back. I broke it. I get to fix it. Joy and I were in Costco the other day. Looking around, we saw rope lights that have eight different solid light settings. They have seven different patterns and they're made to be put up all year round. So you never have to put them up. You never have to take them down ever again. And I decided... <laughs> First of all, that I was going to serve my wife and I was going to buy those this year. And you have a friend of mine, Tom Pogansy, put them up for me because I don't like heights. <laughs> and then Joy's like, what about the boys? And I'm like, what about them? And then I thought, maybe I could be part of fixing what's broken. And so I bought enough. It wasn't that expensive, 150 bucks per home. I mean, it's not like it was a lot of money. It was a lot, but I mean, not. And, and so I bought enough for, for their houses and texted Leah and Eden and said, hey, you guys want some lights for your house? They're like, oh my gosh, yes, but our kids. And I'm like, it's my fault. We're going to fix it. So when we go see them at Thanksgiving, I'm going to be putting lights up on their house. They get to stay up all year round. They can have 4th of July lights, red, white, and blue. You tell it's bad. I broke it. I did. I broke it. So I get to fix it. Now, is that a big deal? I mean, it's not huge, but it's part of taking responsibility for things that we've broken in the past and some things are really a lot more significant. The Bible says there's a proverb here and it's a thinker, okay? A secret gift calms anger and a bribe under the table pacifies fury. If you have a hard time in your heart towards somebody, if you've broken something and you're having a hard time fixing it, if you're having a difficult time wrapping your mind around being a bearer of peace and a reconcile of relationship, a gift given in secret, calms anger. Now you may say, how in the world would the gift that I give calm the anger in the person who receives the gift if they don't know that I gave it? The anger that the author of Proverbs is talking about is not the anger that they have toward you, it's your anger toward them. And the principle's so simple, but so profound. Find something that you think they'll like. Money is not the object. Purchase something that you think would mean something. Give something without them knowing you gave it. And see the icy hardness of your heart begin to melt and chip away. 
Bear peace, restore relationships, leave grace. This Thanksgiving and this Christmas. I wanna pray for you. Father, thank you so much for my friends. And I just pray that as we take a message like this, it's a hard one to let land, easy to deflect. Our minds can be full of excuses, explanations, or we just flat out don't wanna hear it. But perhaps the, the story, as we've said so many times, the story that you are writing in our lives is far more beautiful than the story we would choose to write for ourselves. And we just have to hand you the pen. Maybe this is part of it. Father, I pray that this Thanksgiving and Christmas that we would begin with the people closest to us, whether it be a spouse, a boyfriend, a, a girlfriend, a child, a brother, a sister, a parent, a best friend, a coworker, that we would bear peace in Jesus' name, that we would reconcile relationships for the point of showing love and ultimately sharing the power of the cross of our Savior and our Lord Jesus Christ, who ultimately allowed reconciliation with you. I pray that for my friends, Father. I love them and I'm proud of them. We need help in this. We're not good at it, but your Holy Spirit will give us the insight, the desire, and the stick to itiveness to follow through. And that's what I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand